Hello everyone. Since the AERA annual meeting was canceled, I thought I would record a virtual presentation in an effort to disseminate information that may assist educators engaged in emergency distance learning during COVID-19. So this is conceptualizing access, technology enhanced K-12 education and disabled students. In the United States, there are over 12 million disabled K-12 students and almost 8 million of them receive the majority of their education in general education settings. During the COVID-19 pandemic, when schools are utilizing a distance learning approach, do those millions of disabled students have full and equitable access to the technology mediated general education learning environment? What about non-pandemic technology enhanced learning environments? Do disabled students have full and equitable access to those? The use of technology often erects new barriers for disabled people because not all technology is designed for disabled people's use. In fact, a plethora of technology used in K-12 is inaccessible to disabled people. Consequently, as technologies are being incorporated into K-12 classrooms, disabled students are increasingly confronting the paradoxical situation in which they're present in the general education classroom, but cannot access the learning that takes place therein because the technology that mediates that learning is inaccessible to them. To confront this paradoxical situation and ensure disabled students have full and equitable access to general education in the 21st century, one must first understand the complex situation. Therefore, in this presentation, I address the question, how should disabled students access to technology enhanced K-12 education be conceptualized? I examined the literature from the fields of education, human computer interaction, law and policy, and disability studies. <clears throat> and found that no existing conception of access fully addressed the complex issue of disabled students' access to technology-enhanced K-12 education. Therefore, I developed a cross-disciplinary framework, Accessibility for Equity, to provide the missing holistic picture of the complex and nuanced practice. Given the centrality of the topics of disability and technology to this work, I employed a theoretical framework comprised of perspectives on both topics. I utilized a critical approach to disability, specifically CAFER's political relational model of disability. In this model, CAFER conceptualized disability as relational, arising in relationship among other humans, built and digital architectures, beliefs, cultural norms, and power structures. Moreover, CAFER argued that the problem is built or digital environments and the cultural patterns that exclude or stigmatize particular kinds of bodies, minds, or ways of being. Furthermore, I employed the social shaping perspective of technology, wherein technology is conceived as existing in, the rela in relation to the social, economic, political, and cultural context that it emerges into. From this perspective, technologies are understood to be artifacts that are continually shaped through negotiations with various actors and environments. Thus, technologies are socially constructed and cannot, on their own, cause social change. <clears throat> When considering how access to technology-enhanced K-12 education for disabled students should be conceptualized, I examined the constructs and theories about access to technology and education from four key fields, HCI, law and policy, education, and disability studies, because all four fields offer unique, useful, and sometimes mandatory insight into the topic. After identifying the constructs of access to technology and education from the literature in the four aforementioned fields, I examined points of convergence, divergence, and fusion across disciplinary lines. Finally, I identified gaps in the literature and developed a composite cross-disciplinary framework of disabled students' access to technology-enhanced K-12 education to provide the holistic picture that was missing in the literature. Here's a very brief summary of the prominent ideas about access to technology and education that can be gleaned from the four fields. From the field of HCI, two notions about access to technology are prominent. First, the characteristics and functionality of technologies is the central concern of accessibility. And second, good accessible interfaces are the result of an iterative design process that involves disabled people. To HCI scholars, accessible interfaces afford disabled people access to the same functionality with substantially equivalent ease of use at the same time and in the same place as non-disabled people. Technology accessibility has been operationalized in various laws, policies, and guidelines. These laws and policies are built on a conception of access to technology that is congruent with the HCI approach to accessibility. 
focusing on the characteristics or functionalities that a technology must possess or demonstrate. One of the key US policies pertaining to technology accessibility is Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, which was updated in 2017. The new regulations shift the legal definition of accessibility in the US from one that exclusively focuses on technology to a definition that also incorporates users' interactions with interfaces. Two prominent ideas which pertain to accessing technology and K-12 education emerge from the education field. The deep literature on the digital divide elucidates the fact that access to technology has been fraught with challenges for a wide range of marginalized groups since technology was conceived. The growing universal design for learning literature conveys that access to instruction for disabled students requires educators to first anticipate and remove barriers to learning, and second, to use a flexible pedagogical approach. From the conceptions of access to technology that can be found in the field of disability studies, three prominent themes arise. First, access to technology is a complex and nuanced socio-technical problem that cannot be explained by streamlined linear models. Second, and connected to the first idea, models of access to technology must be multifaceted comprised of many components in order to address the technical, social, and physical aspect, aspects of access. Third, foregrounded in all discussions of access to technology in the field are the concepts of power imbalances and the lived experience of disabled people. In glancing across the literature in all four fields, two critical gaps are evident. First, though some cross-disciplinary models of access are available, no one model that incorporates ideas from all four fields is available. Second, no model exists that, exists that specifically addresses disabled students' access to technology-enhanced K-12 education. Therefore, I developed a cross-disciplinary model of access to technology-enhanced education that specifically focuses on K-12 and disabled students. To attend to the complex problem of equity in the digital age within the deep-rooted public institution of K-12 education, the proposed model of access attempts to address the messy interactions between humans, technologies, cultures, and social structures in a composite framework. The name of the cross-disciplinary framework is Accessibility for Equity. This name emphasizes three key characteristics of the framework. First, the term accessibility is used to connect the framework to the language of accessibility and the disability cultures that developed that language. Second, the phrase for equity reveals the goal of the framework, equity for disabled students in K-12 learning environments. Third, the use of the numeral four symbolizes the integration of constructs of access from four fields. The Accessibility for Equity diagram illustrates the relationships between the various constructs that comprise the framework. The overall structure and arrangement of the framework is informed by Eddie Byrne's A3 model of accessibility. The process-oriented models of access, such as British Standard 8878, and the iterative design philosophy of HCI. The framework features three circles arranged equidistant from one another in a triangular configuration with semicircular two-way arrows connecting the three elements. The three circles are labeled accessibility, advocacy, and accommodation. The two-way arrows emphasize that accessibility is an iterative, always beta process. Looking more closely at the three key elements of the framework, accessibility, advocacy, and accommodation, the incorporation of other existing theories of access is apparent. Zooming in on the largest of the three circles, which is labeled accessibility, one can see the influence of theories from all four fields. The accessibility circle is divided into three equal wedges labeled physical, intellectual, and social. The framework suggests that physical access is accomplished through the use of the legal and HCI conceptions of accessibility. Intellectual access is achieved through the use of UDL. And to achieve social access, the nuanced intersectional understandings of disability and the critical examination of able-bodied power and privilege that arise from disability studies must be incorporated. The medium-sized circle, labeled advocacy, highlights the critical role that disabled people play in the process of access. For decades, one of the mottos of the disability rights movement has been nothing about us without us, meaning that initiatives dealing with disability must include disabled people. 
Moreover, critical pedagogue Paulo Freire argued that authentic liberatory education must be conducted in collaboration with oppressed students. The importance of including disabled people in the process can be seen in models of access that hail from both HCI and disability studies. By including the smallest of the three circles labeled accommodation, the framework acknowledges that individual experiences are unique and some people and some instances may require accommodation in addition to accessibility, an idea that has been advanced by some disability studies scholars. Accommodations might include additional assistive technologies, the addition of a physical intervention, such as a paper tactile graphic, or the aid of a human assistant. However, accommodation should not be viewed within the boundaries of this framework as a replacement for accessibility. Rather, accommodation should be viewed as a way to further support and scaffold a student's learning. Finally, in the middle of the framework is the label K-12. This label serves to situate the framework within the messy context of K-12 education. Furthermore, it's a reminder that the goal is equity for disabled K-12 students who have their own unique lived experiences, which are different from those of disabled adults. Disabled students, for example, are often still learning the alternative techniques, such as assistive technology skills, that disabled adults have long ago mastered. And as a result, the technical standards, such as uh, WCAG, may be insufficient to ensure physical access for disabled youth whose alternative skills are still in development. Ensuring disabled students have full and equitable access to technology-enhanced education is a complex and nuanced socio-technical endeavor that requires K-12 schools and educators to address numerous aspects of their practice. By providing a holistic picture of the complex endeavor, the A4E framework can inform K-12 practice in numerous ways. First, the A4E framework highlights that while conforming to technical standards, that is WCAG, is an important step towards accessible technology-enhanced education, it is only one piece of the practice. Second, the framework emphasizes the importance of including disabled people in initiatives to ensure technology-enhanced education is accessible. Third, the framework positions accessibility as an iterative, always beta process. In indicating that the work of ensuring technology-enhanced K-12 learning environments are accessible will never be complete. During the COVID-19 pandemic, when all K-12 instruction is occurring at a distance and most of that instruction is occurring in some form of digital environment, the A4E framework offers important insight for K-12 practitioners. First, the A4E framework serves as a reminder that disabled students are entitled to full and equitable access to technology-enhanced K-12 education. In the swift transition to distance learning and digital environments, disabled students' access to the K-12 learning environment is often being overlooked. Given the general lack of knowledge about accessibility and the needs of disabled students in digital environments within the field of education, many K-12 schools are poorly positioned to provide fully accessible technology-enhanced learning during stable and ordinary times. The current uncertainty and instability has further exacerbated the situation for educators and more harmfully for disabled students who are trying to learn from a distance. One of the key propositions of the A4E framework is that accessibility is an ongoing process. As a result of their limited accessibility work prior to COVID-19, many K-12 schools are at the very beginning of the accessibility process during this pandemic. The A4E framework suggests a handful of actions for those at the beginning of the process. First, meaningfully engage disabled stakeholders in the work and value their contributions. Disabled employees, disabled youth, and disabled community members will identify inaccessibility and ableism that is baked into K-12 schools emergency distance learning plans, factors that able-bodied educators have overlooked. And if disabled people are meaningfully engaged and their knowledge and viewpoints are valued in future work, inaccessibility and ableism can be addressed before that oppression becomes integral to the learning environment. Second, determine if the key, key platforms you are using for emergency distance learning, such as your learning management system and video conferencing apps, comply with the technical standards for accessibility, that is WCAG 2.1. The technical standards provide the most basic component of accessibility discussed in the A4E framework. 
the door to WCAG in compliant digital environments is locked for disabled students. Those environments are physically inaccessible to them. To determine compliance with WCAG 2.1, you can take two steps. First, review the Accessibility Conformance Report, which is sometimes referred to as the Voluntary Product Accessibility Template, or VPAT. Review those documents for all the platforms that you're using. Keep in mind that the data in those reports is self-reported. You should also have someone, preferably a disabled person, who's an expert in accessibility test the products using both automated tools and assistive technologies. Third, support teachers in developing instruction that's aligned with the principles of universal design for learning to ensure disabled students have intellectual access to instruction. CAST has substantial resources for K-12 teachers about developing UDL-aligned instruction. Those schools who are further along in their accessibility process and have already taken the aforementioned steps could consider deepening their accessibility practice by taking the following actions. First, to ensure that distance learning is socially accessible to disabled students, K-12 schools must critically examine the able-bodied power and privilege within their institutions and the ways in which their institutions reproduce that power. Schools could begin by examining their institutional norms around facilitating synchronous digital gatherings, such as classes and meetings. Are assumptions about able-bodiedness inherent in those norms? Oftentimes, norms around synchronous online meetings assume everyone is sighted and hearing. Consequently, blind and deaf participants in these gatherings are excluded. If disabled people cannot seamlessly engage with their peers in synchronous digital gatherings, those gatherings are socially inaccessible. Second, recognizing that dis disability is not a monolithic experience and some disabled students will need supports in addition to accessible environments in order to have full and equitable access to education, K-12 schools could examine the ways in which resources and people in the non-digital world can further support disabled learners. For example, how could you leverage non-digital resources to support adventitiously disabled students who have not yet mastered the AT they need to navigate an accessible digital interface the school is using for distance learning? Or consider a blind student taking a spatially intense subject like science or math. They need figures in either a paper tactile graphic or a 3D object because technology for representing spatial information in a digital tactile format is still rudimentary and difficult to acquire. Using their power from within the system, K-12 educators can be allies to disabled students, parents, and community members by beginning the accessibility process during COVID-19 and continuing to deepen that practice after the pandemic has ceased. Disabled students have been oppressed by inaccessible technologies since they entered the classroom. Continued work on accessibility after COVID-19 is essential to ensure disabled students have full and equitable access to technology-enhanced K-12 education. Thank you for attending to this digital presentation. I would love to engage with you on Twitter about K-12 technology accessibility. I look forward to your questions, comments, and ideas. <laughs>